Right, it's two o'clock. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Katie Monahan, and I'm a communication strategist here at the Ohio Arts Council. And I'm excited to welcome you to today's webinar, Budgeting for Bronze, Understanding Design and Maintenance Needs for Public Art. So I will introduce our presenters here in just a minute. But before we dive in, there are, of course, just a few housekeeping items that we need to go over. So first, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode. This just helps to cut down on any feedback issues during the presentation, but that doesn't mean you have to stay silent. If you have a question at any point, go ahead and drop it in the Q&A box there in your control panel. We'll monitor those throughout the webinar, and we'll be sure to leave plenty of time to answer all of those during the dedicated Q&A session at the end. Next, live captioning is available for this webinar, and you can access those captions by clicking on the closed captioning icon, the little CC down there in your control panel, and selecting show subtitle. And if you have audio issues or trouble connecting, we recommend refreshing your browser. And if that doesn't work, try logging off and logging back in. And also please keep in mind that because we are presenting from our homes, there may be some slight variations in bandwidth or internet stability. So um, if the sound fluctuates or one of us freezes up, thank you in advance for bearing with us. I promise we will, we will keep on rolling through any um, te technical snags. And finally, we are recording today's webinar and the recording will be available on our webinars uh, page at oac.ohio.gov slash webinars and on our YouTube channel by early next week. All right, that's it for housekeeping. Next, I'd like to welcome our friend, Joyce Barrett. Joyce is the Executive Director of Heritage Ohio, Ohio's statewide preservation organization whose mission is helping people save the places that matter, build community, and live better. We're really excited to partner with Joyce and Heritage Ohio to present this webinar, so I'm going to hand things over to her so she can introduce today's speaker. Joyce, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Um, why don't you go ahead and get us rolling? Okay, thank you very much. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our friend, Lindsay Jones. She's the owner and primary conservator of Blind Eye Restoration, LLC, located here in Columbus, Ohio. Lindsay has worked all over the country on a variety of architectural and restoration and conservation projects, and she specializes in material conservation. And so we're so glad to have her share her expertise with all of you here. Okay, so I guess we'll get started. So I'm Lindsay. Uh, if you've not heard of what an architectural conservator is, um, we specialize um, in building materials, materials that are generally interacted with by the public in the weather, have to be structurally sound and um, long lasting without the necessary protections you might find in a museum setting. So oftentimes I'll be working on decorative plaster, tile floors, stained glass, bronze um, doors, or pressed architectural elements like you see in this first photo. But we can also correlate that understanding, that knowledge into those same materials used in the public art space, looking at Tessera glass tile mosaics, on the facade of Cantor Art Museum in um, California. Um, there's the decorative arches in English Park, um, multiple different pieces around Columbus bronze, um, cast, cast iron, uh, stainless steel, wood, different things. All these different things are found in your same architectural elements as we find in the public art pieces. And the same information is needed, knowing how to keep water away, knowing how to protect from damage, clean, clean in general, um, different materials that react are safe, that type of stuff. So today we're going to be talking about the uh, process of planning for public art and then the maintenance of it into the future. So the phases that we're looking at, beginning with the conception, Obviously, before anything gets put together, we want to talk about the appearance, the thoughtfulness behind, like, what is this saying to the community? What is it bringing to the community? Um, appearance and design intention, site selection, uh, 
permanent versus temporary? How long is this piece actually going to be here? Um, and if there's any interest in a primary material by the owner entity or the particular artist who might be a part of this. Design review. This is always the big one. Um, nowadays, everybody is pretty familiar with the design review and the importance of the design review, but what is actually going into that? The goal of this is obviously to catch potential immediate and long-term material and textual issues. It's a good time to pull together a lot of the specifics of the long-term management budgets as well. What is it going to cost us in the long run? Thinking about what maintenance needs does it need just generally? How often you're gonna to have to take care of it? Um, what are the bigger issues with this piece that might be more costly if something happens to, if graffiti happens to limestone, for instance, much bigger issue um, than if you get some chalk on some stainless steel. There are just different levels of potential damage and costs associated with those. And so it's something that you can kind of think of here. So we're looking at reactive materials, making sure that the artist design uh, incorporates things that are going to be protective um, but not also damaging in the long run. Um, considering the artist's vision versus public perception. Uh, the acquisition contract is a big thing that's important for uh, the owner's safety, talking about warranty and maintenance plan and keeping uh, all of those things readily available when they're needed, whenever the, the piece needs attention. Having someone in the review board who understands the fabrication techniques as well as the environmental design considerations of different materials is very important. Um, we don't want to stifle the creativity. We don't want to limit material choices. You do want to make sure that your piece reaches its fullest potential lifespan and so in a fiscally responsible way. So we're looking at the sealants and protective coatings how they react when they're actually needed, if they're even allowed, depending on if your community has a, um, a material maintenance book uh, for artists to look at. If we are allowing like seal coats on stone, that's a consideration that you really want to consider before you are allowing that on your piece when it initially goes in. Um, different metals need different attention. Woods, you need to understand hardwood versus softwood, the different species. Um, your stone, igneous versus sedimentary versus metamorphic, they have different absorbency rates, um, especially in comparison to concrete and cast stone. We also have to consider the difference there. Stone hardness is not the same as concrete and um, plaster and stucco. A lot of similarities to concrete, but also needed to be treated and maintained differently. Terrazzo has all sorts of stuff that goes into it. You need to make sure that there's mineral pigment, that there's expansion joints. Um, all these things kind of need to be considered. You can't just throw something out there and expect that it's gonna just be perfectly the same 10 years from now as it was when you set it in. These review boards we're talking about should consist of at least, if not subcontracting to a couple of these people, we're looking at landscape professionals, people who can talk about the plants or surrounding um, material surfaces and how they're going to react in comparison to the piece as it's put in. Your structural engineer, you wanna make sure that not only do we know that the surface materials, how they're going to react over time, you wanna make sure that the piece can hold itself up, that it's not going to be a danger overhanging uh, a street potentially, or if a child is climbing on it, that it's not gonna knock it over. We need to know that all of that stuff is safe and it's taken care of, considered ahead of time. Um, it's good to have an art conservator, uh, architectural conservator, or even a professional mason welder, who whatever the thing is made of, looking at modern contractors, the people who are actually putting the piece together and getting their consideration on how well the design is put together. I've run into um, masonry pieces that didn't have drip edges and or a capstone and, immediately within a year had water damage. And that's not something you should have to deal with. You should know ahead of time, a mason could have told them, this is not a good design, you're gonna have issues. Um, and of course the owner, owner's rep community that it's for, whatever space it's going into, we wanna make sure that there is a consensus 
that the design of this piece is acceptable to everybody that's going to be you know, in ownership of it, that are gonna have it in their everyday lives. Like I said, design reviews can be contentious. You can minimize this. Ask for a warranty. It's kind of surprising to me that so many people don't with these public art pieces. We spend so much money on these and it goes out into such a public visible place that we wanna make sure that they're at least going to stand up for a little while after they've been put in. There should be no immediate issues with your piece. And if there is, if there's a surface damage or something, like we should have some kind of agreement up front with the artist. And then you should actually check on the piece within two years. If you only have a one year warranty, you should check on the piece within a year or every six months within that year, making sure that you are actually covered, that nothing is happening and looking at it from all sides, all the way at the top, all the way at the bottom. If you can't see it standing on the sidewalk, you need to get up and look at that different surface. Um, asking for documentation of the phases specified in the fabrication plan. Things change, um, time limits or time constraints, uh, available materials. I don't recommend hovering over anybody. As a contractor myself, I do not appreciate it. It is super stressful and does not make the process go better. But asking them to take photos and send them to you. Let us know how the progress is going. Make sure that if there was uh, a spec in the fabrication document that said this will be primed and then painted, there's a picture of it primed and then painted and or a top coat, you know, something that you couldn't necessarily see uh, from the outside once the piece is installed. Like it's good to have documentation of what the interior structure looks like in case the piece for some reason has to be somewhat dismantled or in case there's any fear of structural damage, knowing where to get in um, because like bronze pieces can be x-rayed on a large scale, but it is not cheap. Um, and it'd be much easier just to know what the structure is inside. Um, we're also looking at asking your artist for recommendation on a maintenance plan and giving all of the information, spec sheets and everything for the products they used. If there's any top coats, if there was a particular mixture or admixture in like a concrete cast form, um, we wanna know that because sometimes things will happen down the road, damage will occur years later, or if we have to replace a piece or do another coating, you wanna make sure you're doing as much in kind as possible and not knowing the artist's plan or not having saved that information, it's really hard to recreate and you really have to bring in a specialist to do investigation of that stuff. So fabrication, um, things can happen. Like I said, uh, we've got timing issues. We've got material availability, common or newly designed, uncommon or newly designed products. This is a big argument of mine. I'm, I specialize in historic architecture where materials and methods were the same for hundreds of years. They're tested. Everybody knows how it works. There are maintenance plans out there from generations ago. Like we know how it goes. We know what to look for. Modern materials is not always that way. We can't always trust something that just came on the market. And so if you have a product in the fabrication plan that has not been time tested, it's modern, not to say you should say no automatically, but you should have that documented. Make sure that it's watched. Make sure that it's one of those things that you look at during your warranty period to see how it's aging. Um, think about how costly it would be to have to repair those types of things. Um, surfaces that don't drain water away. If you have a flat surface that you can't see, or you have um, a flat surface that wasn't supposed to be flat, but then when it was built, it kind of got flat or there's a dip, um, just keeping an eye on those things, if they were okay to be that way, um, or if there's something that can be done to mitigate that becoming an issue. Um, and also if it's dangerous to the public, if it's created and it's just like, oh, you know, there's some really sharp edges on this thing, or it's just, it's gonna hang out over a space, or it's just way more climbable than we realized or we thought it was gonna be, when it's actually physically in front of you, uh, you'll 
you'll find out a lot of stuff that you maybe didn't consider in the before times. I don't know, during the design review, there's, there's just always a chance that that's going to happen. And so just use it as another opportunity, again, to look at it. Does this still hit all of the criteria? Are there any new problems that have popped up? Are there any maintenance issues that we're going to have to think about moving forward? Installation. So it's kind of the same thing as with maintenance. Things are going to occur that you weren't fully expecting. And whether it was fully assembled prior to installation or if it's assembled on location, if it was painted on location, you're going to have potential issues. Again, angles of water diversion. It was never meant to be a flat surface, but when it got put on this little hill, all of a sudden it's flat. Um, you'll realize that the landscaping that goes in around it, AKA grass, uh, around a piece that is highly trafficked is going to be an issue. Um, public interaction and safety. Again, you think of this as great, this is an interactive piece, and then you don't consider the wear and tear that the public interacting with it is going to cause, um, which is maybe a maintenance issue and or a extra time and effort and treatment thing that is going to be a possibility. Um, we poles, say in those angles of water diversion or areas that could potentially gather water, we try to add weep poles or masonry structures where we add weep poles. If those weep poles accidentally get blocked, no point in even having a weep pole there anymore. So we wanna make sure that we're following through on all of those design plans, things that we're gonna help maintain it in the long run, make sure that when it's actually installed that they're still exactly the way we had planned. Maintenance. So um, kind of where we decided or discussed in the um, design review, different materials are gonna have different issues. Different materials need different maintenance. So between bronze and chrome, you would think not too much difference, um, but, or sorry, bronze and other metals. Um, chrome seems a lot like um, stainless steel which it is, but it also has such a shiny surface that is, it has pinpoint spots where water can get in and can create rust in a way that stainless steel doesn't show the same way. Stainless steel and chrome both rust, though, so just FYI, don't be confused by the name. Um, and so chrome especially needs to be waxed and stainless steel, if it's brushed, um, you can usually use a, a rust retarder or, you know, there's different things that you can do for that. Um, but it's, it's something that you can't just believe the name. Um, bronze, depending on where it is next to the public, it could be waxed once a year and be fine. It could be twice a year with a pigmented wax because people touch it so much, or it could be, um, you know, you have to consider hot wax versus cold wax you have to consider what time of year are we getting to it. Um, the patina can sometimes be an issue. Having to re-patina something, especially a large something, is not a, a slight consideration. That is, it's a big thing if you wanna get an even patina overall. Um, plastics, you can just wash and manually clean. You can never use a solvent. Like you, if when you're cleaning a graffiti, you can't, if you're trying to get spray paint off, you have to physically abrade to get that off because you cannot actually use a solvent because it'll actually melt your plastic. Um, stone, a lot of people want to put sealants on stone automatically to save it from graffiti. And I will tell you, almost never should you do that immediately, uh, especially for igneous where we find a lot of granite in public art um, because eventually it'll fail and then it'll cause more issues with the stone. If you have a bigger issue with graffiti and you wanna keep stuff off, there are sacrificial coatings you can put on there. Or if you're going to be putting a coating on in the first place, you should do coatings every time you come back to do, or as often as the material requires, you need to be doing it regularly. You can't just put it on once and forget about it. Um, cement is something that can leach and create all sorts of weird um, lime scale, it can uh, spall pretty easily and you need to seal it pretty regularly if it's in a, a, an area that is directly 
Um, well, if it's outside, I should just say if it's outside. Um, I'm also, for everybody's consideration, I'm considering all of these pieces as outdoors. There are also considerations for indoor, indoor public art um, and site-specific public art that I'm not necessarily touching on here, um, but these are the bigger issues for maintenance. Um, so if you have any specific interior public art questions, let me know. Um, I'm just trying to touch on the, the big extreme things that'll most likely pop up, which is usually an outdoor art. Um, and wood, I kind of touched on that earlier. You should know the species that you're putting in and um, make sure that it is a hardwood, something that can survive outdoors well, that it's got good joints that'll last and you need to protect it. Uh, you probably have known, if you've seen anybody with a, a nice old wood front door, um, it can be under a porch and it still needs to be resealed every couple of years. So something that is directly out in the weather needs to be protected. For any collections where the art was acquired and only maintained when major damage or deterioration is known, it is recommended to have the collection surveyed and documented by a qualified conservator who can provide you with a priority list of maintenance and repair needed. So if you have or are um, in charge of a collection of art that has not really been seen, not been regularly maintained, um, is potentially having issues that you can kind of see there's some differences, but you're not really sure how deep it goes or what the extent of maintenance needed is, that's a good time to talk to a conservator. Decession. So not something anybody really wants to consider, but when we're talking about this in the design review, we should consider that if this is not something the community loves, if it's not a long-term piece, if there's any chance of property development in the future of this space and we have to move it, if you're still going to be the owner of it, and financially responsible for moving it, you should consider maybe scale, um, maybe how it's set in the ground or how it's stabilized. Uh, there's, there's a major cost to this kind of movement um, and nobody wants to have to deal with it or consider it, but it happens. We know it happens, specifically here in Columbus, we know it happens. This picture in particular being the removal of the Christopher Columbus statue in front of our courthouse this past year. So documentation. We're gonna begin with the artist documents. You need to keep a record, keep all of these things. I've run into art institutions that don't actually, or haven't kept a good record. They didn't keep these together. There wasn't a, a bound living document. And so when you get this information, find a safe place for it, make it something that is accessible to the entire organization or into the future, put it somewhere where you know it's going to be found by the public if it happens to need to land there. Um, it doesn't need to hold financial information, but it's just a good idea to have it all together so that you can reference it. Um, get your warranty your material construction and maintenance recommendations and artist intent, uh, all of these things. Artist intent is something um, as it's aging, if the artist wants it to age, if it wants to look like sometimes the bronze patina, uh, it's change over time when left exposed and not regularly waxed. Uh, they, maybe that's something that they want. Uh, there's also like things like core 10 steel that's allowed to rust over time obviously something that you don't are not allowed to rust over time. The surface of it is rusted. It's its own protective coating. Um, the artist probably wants that maintained, but you also need to know, okay, well, is there a recommendation for if it gets graffitied? Because that's not just coming off and it's probably going to hurt the visual appearance of the steel to sand off that graffiti or power wash it. You're going to have a big visual blob in the surface. And so how do we make that come back to what it was doing an acid etching or some such. The artist is gonna have the best recommendation for future treatment that you can follow. Visiting the piece regularly is very important and walking past it can do a lot of good. I actually maintain a piece that is a couple of blocks away and I see it two, three times a week on a dog walk. And I can tell you right now that I have lots of things to say about it. And it's literally just a plaque. Um, 
it's got bushes around it that I wish were cut back by uh, the people whose property it's on and all sorts of stuff. But I can also tell you that I know how the last treatment is aging. I can tell you how the stone is doing since the last cleaning. Um, and so visual inspection by your, the owning entity or organization artist is important. Also, it's helpful to the community if anything happens to it, if there's something around the piece that mentions who the artwork is owned by so they can potentially reach out to you in case something happens to it. Um, usually somebody knows if it's in a very public space uh, who to talk to, um, but sometimes these things can go a while and graffiti especially can be really problematic if it's left go for more than a week even. Um, so it's important to, to know that nothing is going wrong with the piece and nothing's been let sit um, in a dangerous or damaging way. I also wanna take pictures. So taking pictures when the piece is installed at least once a year, um, once of the overall piece in general. You also wanna take specific up close photos of any issues that you're having. Um, and I say overall piece, you're not obviously going to be able to get everything in one shot but it gives you a good comparison sometimes if there's color fading, if there's dirt accumulating on flat surfaces, water runoff trails or any rust spots, flaking paint, um, major visual differences obviously are going to be the concern. And sometimes you might not notice it um, when you're looking at it from the micro scale and you have to step back and look. Um, but we also want documentation if anything grows, expands, um, we have issues with cracking or flaking or, you know, something, and it helps you understand how fast the deterioration is happening and how urgent the need is for repair or restoration. Sometimes things just age and it's not a great hurry and it allows you a little bit of time to budget for the repair, um, but sometimes it's not. So it's good to have that regular documentation of scale, size, um, overall and micro. So you've been walking past it, you've been taking pictures of it, you have the documents that the artist left with you when the piece was installed. You should be keeping all of these things in one place. Like I said, you have that document that you put somewhere that everybody can find whenever, make it a living document, make it updated every year so that everybody knows. <laughs> uh, this is the material that we used last year. If somebody happens to move on to a new job and forgets to mention, oh yeah, this is where I bought that paint product, or this is the salesman I talked to, he'll know where to get a small portion of this very specific product or sealer or something you need. And otherwise it's like $200 a gallon or silly things like that. It's going to be helpful um, to put that out there and just make sure that even if you think, ah, oh, this is redundant, I'm totally gonna remember next year. Nobody else has your memory and it's gonna be lost with you if you don't put it out there. So put all of your photos, put all of your um, investigation, your notes, everything, put it in this document and make sure it's saved. All right, so the investigation now and restoration, this is considering if the piece is not brand new. We don't have to go through design review. Piece is already out in the world. It exists. We are just taking it now from a new point where say we don't have maintenance records um, and we want to start doing regular maintenance and taking care of the piece and making sure that it is in good standing. So things you can do on your own um, as the owning entity of the piece, keep your record of the conditions, obviously conduct regular maintenance cleaning and waxing. If you do not know or are slightly unsure if there's any concern about um, specific treatment for specific pieces, there's a lot you can do for different things and I can't tell you just do this for that. Um, so it's a good idea to have somebody come and look at the piece and say what the treatment actually is for it. But usually, once you have that documentation um, you, or that recommendation consultation, you can have your team go ahead and do the maintenance themselves on a regular basis and not have to pay for a specialty conservator to come in and do it. 
when you should contact a conservator is when graffiti occurs because it's going to be an issue. Um, there are certain moments when it's just chalk or it's something that you can gently rinse off, no big deal. If it came out of a spray can, it's a problem. Different solvents do different things to substrates. They do different things to patinas and you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Um, usually on stone graffiti is, if you can get to it immediately, say like, like I said earlier, limestone and graffiti is very bad because it's very porous. And once the graffiti hardens, it's hard to find a solvent that'll get rid of it without damaging the stone itself. We use power washers a lot when it comes to graffiti because it's just one of the few things that really gets it out in a timely manner. Um, but we really try not to with limestone. You wanna to get to it as fast as possible. Um, there are different solvent poultices you can use, which take a little bit more time. They take a little bit more prep. You have to specifically test the different solvents on the surface to make sure that they're not gonna create any long-term issues. Um, it can just be, yeah, tricky. So make sure that if you have issues with graffiti um, in that area, that you're looking at anti-graffiti protection methods, sacrificial coatings, um, making sure that you have somebody on hand who can get to it quickly if possible. Um, another thing to contact a conservator about is when a damaging reaction occurs or aging has changed the look of the piece. Um, sorry, sirens. Um, obviously you're doing the maintenance, you're visually observing, you're around the piece, you're documenting, but sometimes you're just like, I don't know what's causing this. Uh, I don't know if that's a problem. I don't know if that's getting worse. Call somebody about it. Make sure that there's somebody who has the background and experience to come and look at it and just tell you definitively that this is going to be an issue. Um, and also when the piece has no maintenance records, because you don't know what's happened to it over time. You want to make sure that you understand that there are, if there are specific coatings, if there are issues with past specific coatings, if there is uh, an internal structural issue that you're not noticing, if there was something just kind of inherently wrong with the piece in the first place, those are things that a conservator can tell you. And also they can give you a beginning, wait, did I put that on the next slide? Services. <laughs> um, so things that this conservator can provide, uh, base document. So we were talking about the, the public living document that you're creating. Conservator can create that base document for you. Can have all of the base photographs, can give you the material uh, issues, um, the base material and how it's supposed to function, how it can age, things to look out for, um, maintenance record, what they did, what they recommend in the future for maintenance planning, uh, recommendations for the hierarchy of treatments needed in your collection for budgetary purposes. This can come with any consultation. It doesn't have to be a full document of all of the pieces. It can just say, okay, well, we walked around, we went to all of the pieces that you'd mentioned, um, we looked at the conditions of all of them, here are what they are, this is what you should start with, and can give you actual um, prices for that conservation that they could do, obviously. Um, but it gives you something, at least in the ballpark, if you decide that there's another more affordable way to move forward. Um, they can also do the physical conservation and treatments, obviously. Um, sometimes it makes more sense financially just to have the, the waxing and washing done by a conservator because they have the necessary equipment and they can budget the time. And sometimes it's just faster and you can get around to a bunch of pieces all at once and it's literally their job. So it just makes sense. Um, other times they can train your team to do the maintenance and restoration so that you can do it within your own organization. And it can just be part of the regular salary of somebody that you have on staff. So a couple of the pieces that I work on, I didn't put a title set on this, but uh, issues that I've run into just on our daily, daily, in our regular uh, contracted work, um, things that are outside of the regular maintenance cleaning that could be considered that 
I noticed as a conservator that anybody walking by might not have thought of. So just to give you an idea of things that you would look out for in your own pieces, or I guess just a consideration of something, you know, FYI, it's not always so straightforward and it's good to have somebody come and look because you're not always going to realize. So this particular piece um, is a, right next to our side river downtown, Lucas Sullivan. He is very tall. I have to have a 45 foot lift to get up to the peak of his little flag. Um, he is dark patinaed bronze from his like foot base up to the top, but he has glass eyeballs that are sealed in with uh, a, a cock, a silicone cock. Um, so the bronze is its own issue. The weird glass eyes, they're very creepy. I almost put a photo on here, but I didn't want to give you all nightmares. Um, the glass eyes themselves, probably fine. They're not going to weather. They're not highly exposed. They're not going to be physically abraded, really. Um, the silicone cock around them, I have to watch that as it ages, make sure that, that there's no water infiltration issues, that the eyes aren't slipping out for any reason, that it hasn't come loose. Um, and that's something you have to be in a 25 foot lift minimum to get up there and be able to see his eyes up close enough to be able to tell. There's also uh, on his base, he has um, a granite base or might be limestone base actually. Um, but the, the stone has basically uh, taken on the patina of the bronze because the, the statue itself wasn't maintained super well for a lot of years. And with water taking, tripling down, it takes the minerals at the surface of the bronze and drags it down the patina down onto the stone the stone absorbs it and is now turning the stone green. Uh, that is not the color of the, the stone naturally. It is definitely patinaed. And that patina color is extremely hard to get out, if almost impossible. It takes very noxious chemicals to remove, very expensive noxious chemicals. Um, and it's one thing to do that to a base. It's another to do that around uh, all of these bronze plaques that are on the face of it. Now, these are only two that are pictured, but there's two very similar to the circle one on the left on the other two sides. And three of those need to be waxed regularly. Um, they can be hot waxed, which makes it easier to get into the crevices. Um, the one on the front can only be cold waxed because it has a lacquer coating. Um, on the right photo, you can see that the lacquer is starting to fail because the bright shiny bits um, on the letters and around the sides are starting to get a little bit dark and speckly. As you can tell that weather has broken through the lacquer and is now making the bronze underneath patina. So when you start to see that, it makes it a little unreadable. Um, if you see the patina on the background of the letters start to get a little brighter and fuzzier, um, it could be wearing away the dye on the bronze there. So basically this plaque needs to be taken all the way down re-patinaed, re-lacquered, and waxed regularly because it wasn't waxed often enough and it let the lacquer fail. But if we're also doing the patina cleaning off of the stone all the way around it, we have to super protect all the bronze so that we're not getting a terrible chemical reaction on the metal and etching it. And that stone cleaner may not be 100% effective. Like I said, it's really, really difficult to get that patina to leave and sometimes it's just fully embedded. Like I said, limestone can be a real problem with things that are absorbed and it's been in there for tens of years, at least at this point. So three at least issues there where we're dealing with multiple different types of treatments in the same piece, plus the need for access. Um, and you might hear that power washing, I said, I said earlier, graffiti for power washing, don't love it, but it kind of needs to happen in low pressure, pressure washing. Um, but for sculptures, basically using a chemical sprayer. So that thing can maybe reach 10 feet and you really have to be able to get up there and actually wipe things off, um, scrub. And it's really best to avoid the power washer anyway, because it takes you away from the piece 
you can't get up close and really notice uh, what's going on. This sculpture had weird paint daubs, like somebody maybe shot it with a uh, paintball gun in the past because it had like orange and blue on his back up high, like way up high. Somebody probably thought it rinsed off enough and it was fine, but it stuck there and it is just about embedded in the metal now and it's kind of difficult to get out, but I wouldn't have known that if I had used a power washer. Getting up close and personal um, is really what gets you the information what's going on with a piece like this. Um, you mentioned earlier, removing pieces, not exciting to have to deal with um, financially. Also, I know the um, public arts coordinator who is dealing with this removal and there are so many hoops to jump through making sure that everybody is happy, what's happening to the piece afterwards. It wasn't a great piece to begin with. It was actually, I wouldn't call it pop metal, but it was a variety of different metals mixed that made it problematic for um, refinishing. It tended to uh, rust easily in a couple of different splotchy locations. And um, there are a couple of reasons that I am on the side of the city for removing on this. And one of them is specifically just the fact that this large piece was a paint clean and to maintain. And it was actually more expensive um, to maintain than, than most pieces in the city. And the fact that it was politically traumatizing um, for a lot of people, it made it a, a good choice for removal. If you're gonna remove anything, something that's already having physical issues, um, it makes sense to me. Uh, this piece, you saw the, the photo on the right earlier. Um, this sculpture is one I'm dealing with right now. It was installed four years ago. And when I went to visit it last winter, it looked perfectly fine. We figured, oh, maybe we'll like pay attention to the mortar joints in the base. Um, just get a good documentation for the, um, the records document. And when I got up there, I, so I was there in January, February, and I went up this past month to take a look at it and do like formal photography and investigation. And most of these rust spots on, you can't quite tell, but there are a lot of rust spots visible from the ground now, which I was just like, oh, wow, where did those come from? Uh, little nicks and things here and there. Okay, maybe we can get a little bit of paint to just touch those up really fast, like weird little flakes. And then I got up to the level of the purple volume to look at the top. And this is what I saw, which was a complete surprise to everybody involved, including the artist himself. But there is no warranty on this. Um, granted, it was four years, but from the ground, you couldn't tell anything was going on. Nobody had investigated this upper flat surface because didn't figure you had to. Um, and we are potentially thinking that this piece was not actually primered. There is a two-part epoxy paint coating on all of the, the painted surfaces including some, some texture in four of the five. Um, it has to be sprayed on, it has no pot life, like you mix it together, you spray it, it's done for, and it's very expensive. And it looks like there was never a metal primer put on and there was probably wasn't a protective top coating put on, but that's what was specced. And it was probably a confusion on the fabricator's part because the artist didn't actually make this piece, they sent it to a fabricator. And so there were just a couple of layers of separation from anybody who was a part of the review board in the actual fabrication of the piece. Um, nobody was paying attention or thinking about what the specs were for the painting of this. Um, it was also, uh, it was made of carbon steel where a painted, product like this, it's probably safer to go with an aluminum, something that isn't going to have the same kind of rusting issues. So some stuff that could have been done in design review, in following through with the fabrication process, and in following through with investigation and actually looking at the piece from all sides in the first year after installation, just to see if you could tell this was happening right away. Um, because now the whole piece is probably going to have to be sanded down and repainted and it's going to be not cheap. So stuff like that is a good reason to just get up and look at stuff, even though it's immediately been installed because you never know. Uh, these deer, 
are located in Columbus. They're also right on the river. And they were meant by the artist to be interactive. He wanted the public to be touching them and walking around them and taking pictures with them. And they do. I will clean these, walk two feet away, and somebody's behind me running up to the deer to hug and take pictures with it, all of them. Um, and you can tell uh, the backside of the deer on the left looking over the bridge, he's, his patina is wearing off. And there's nothing to do with that except for totally uninstall him, take him somewhere, chemically strip, strip and re-patina. That's what it is. And these were installed um, before the city of Columbus had a maintenance program or a budget for maintenance. And so they didn't think about having these waxed every year or twice a year now is what we're doing um, to try and maintain a patinaed wax on the back so that you don't visually see that, but also just to keep a protective layer there so no more of the base patina comes off. Um, it's also happening to the deer on the steps, on his antlers and on his shoulders. And the, the deer reclining on the hill, the tummy's all worn off. Um, other issues that we're having, obviously the deer in the center is there's an erosion problem. The pedestrians walking around the deer are wearing away the earth, the grass. It's on a little bit of a hill. So water is somebody, you can see all the like gray blue there around. Um, it's supposed to be all the way around the deer, but um, it's grass seed. And that was put down by the parks department after I told them that you need something here, everything's eroding. Um, they just threw grass seed down and then it rained and it ran down the hill. Uh, it's also not helping the fact that the under, you can see under the, the arm hoof, um, the substructure's poking out of the ground, which is becoming a tripping hazard potentially. And we don't want that to wear away anymore. So we are considering different uh, surface landscaping options. The artist wanted grass underneath it. So potentially different types of grass that are more hardy. Um, we do, really don't want to rope off the piece, but we might have to in order to get something to root there because otherwise this erosion is just going to keep happening. And the exposed dirt is not only just eroding away, it's also splashing up on the piece and causing it to be dirty and potentially the splashback is not helping um, keep the wax on there either. So lots of different issues with these that weren't necessarily expected that have to just be dealt with now. Uh, this piece was also shown earlier. Um, the center photo is the one that you saw in my photos, and that was how it was installed and that how it was approved through design review. The stripes are actually layers of uh, different colored stone that were, um, they were attached, but the attachment process didn't account um, for gravity, there was some movement in the piece that caused the stones to kind of slip and slide and they weren't sitting flat anymore. It became a danger to the public. This is already, there's two of these. I'm only showing one side, but they actually are coming across a road. Like that's a, it's called the flowing kiss. There's like little lips on the tip and they're like coming across the road at each other. Um, so the stone was becoming an issue and they had to go back. Thankfully, this one got caught early. Um, they had the artist go back and recreate a new base. And this one is with uh, brushed stainless steel. So the top is chrome. The, the base is brushed stainless steel. And when I came in, uh, they just wanted a basic cleaning. But we found that the chrome was spotting and rusting all over. And the same kind of thing was happening on the stainless steel below, but it was a little bit easier to clean up because you can actually abrade that surface and do um, oils and rust inhibitors and things. But the chrome, you can't abrade the chrome. And so we went through and we did a polish of the entire bell on both sides, which includes scaffolding and a full day on each sculpture of buffing and washing and then waxing and polishing. Um, and it stopped, it, it removed a great deal of the rust spots, but that's actually something that we're gonna have to do regularly because those spots are gonna come back. The pinpoints in the chrome are there. They're there for good. That's how it was made, made. And water is gonna continue to get in there and sit and cause rust issues. So 
our job from now on is going to be waxing and polishing this piece. Um, we may not always use the chrome polish because we don't want to wear away the surface of the chrome, but waxing is definitely going to be a part of the maintenance plan on top of regular washing. And that's it for me. Questions? Thank you so much, uh, Lindsay. I'll be helping to monitor the questions. We have a lot of good questions in both the Q&A box as well as the chat box. And so we'll just get started with some of them. Uh, Terry has a question. Any recommendations for how to maintain, restore steel that has been powder coated? Ooh, uh, honestly, I think you're looking at recoding. Um, Coatings like that, patching is going to look spotty. Um, I could maybe give you more specific information if I saw the piece, uh, if it needs to be uninstalled or not. Also, if you talk to different companies that do powder coating, um, they might be able to give you a better idea of what the process is gonna be. It's not something that a conservator can do themselves usually. So that is going to be a specific contract with a powder coating company. Um, there are people who powder coat bikes. Um, there are just, depending on what their specialty is, you can call around to a couple of different places. Don't assume that one place is your only option, that everybody's gonna be exactly the same. Sometimes they have different specialties and scale and if things have to be in their shop or if they can do things on site, what the prep looks like. Um, but yeah, I think, the point is that you're basically gonna to have to get it probably redone. Um, not much you can do there without spotty treatment. Uh, you could also go in with a different surface treatment. That is an option. Painting is something that's more easily maintainable on site. Um, but uh, for the powder coating itself, if that is the artist's intended surface, then you're probably gonna to have to get it redone. Okay, we have a lot of questions actually having to do with coding, so they might be a little different to the person asking the question, so I'm just going to go through all of them. Advice for fiberglass sculptures coated with automotive clear coating. Well, you should know what the clear coating is. Uh, there's not knowing what the product is specifically. I can't tell you anything about the appropriateness for the piece. Um, I think uh, a clear coating an automotive, so I guess I should say this, uh, Bondo is, gets a bad rap, I think, but it's really good for what it does. It has the same, it has an expansion uh, contraction equivalent to most metals. Um, and if it's going to be recoded, it's a great thing to smooth over if it's getting painted. Um, so something that's automotive actually usually has a pretty good correlation for outdoor art pieces, specifically metal. Um, I have to see what was happening with the fiberglass sculpture itself, but as long as it's pretty hard and stable, it should be fine. It could be that it just needs to be recoded. Um, if it's yellowing, that could be an issue. Sometimes um, particular coatings just yellow, they're just not as quality um, and would have to be redone over time. The removal of the coating should be sensitive to the fiberglass quality to making sure that it doesn't damage the substrate. However you choose to do that, or if it can just be scuffed, um, the coating can be scuffed and recoded. That would probably be the best um, way of maintaining that. Okay, any recommendations for protecting a fiberglass sculpture from graffiti? Uh, there are clear sacrificial coatings out there. Prosecco makes some. Um, specific to what the fiberglass looks like um, and how, so I'm not sure when I say clear, it's like clear on stone. Um, and I'm not sure exactly if it would come off the most clear on fiberglass, if it would almost look cloudy. Um, but there are, there are sacrificial materials out there that I would recommend for anybody who has an issue with um, a potentially easily damaged or easily discolored or you're just concerned about that substrate. Um, sacrificial coatings for graffiti are really great. Uh, you just roll them on 
And then whenever uh, an inst instance of graffiti happens, you clean it off, the coating comes with it, you reapply the coating. Okay, another question, does IPE require maintenance or can you just let it patina? IPE. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure, I'm sure. <laughs> Deanna, can you elaborate on IPE? I wasn't I'm sure. I thought maybe you know. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. I'm so, what is it again? Hmm? Okay, just a second. Oh. Okay, we'll go to another question. Um, just a second. When masonry has been unintentionally damaged, sandblasting, weather, do you ever consider the use of hardeners or inorganic silicate stains as a means to restore a surface? So, yes, sandblasted brick needs something. Sandblasted masonry, uh, well, sandblasted masonry. Sometimes harder stones, they can handle the texture. Um, brick, because it was fired, because it has that um, like the fired membrane, basically, when you get rid of it, it just tries to dissolve itself. Um, you'll find the same with uh, party walls on old buildings where the interior brick was never really meant to be exposed and it was structurally sound so long as it wasn't exposed. Um, these things, they usually do need some kind of, um, I don't want to say sealer, but uh, a water repellent, um, something that keeps them breathing because water will inevitably get in. When something's clear, you're never going to get a perfect coating um, and water will get in and you need it to be able to breathe and get back out again. Um, but it needs something, yeah, kind of like a stabilizer to help it uh, hold itself together so it doesn't like basically wash away in the rain. Okay, we're going back to Deanna's question. IPE is a type of wood from Brazil. Okay. So she asked about the required maintenance, or can you just let it patina? Gotcha. Um, it's, I don't know a lot about that specific wood. I would say that even cedar technically gets a coating. Um, Woods that are supposed to be able to be outside and not rot or not have issues, teak, they have issues. Um, and I would recommend there be something. Um, you can, I mean, there are ways of treating it so that it can last outdoors with less maintenance. Um, but I don't really trust anything to be totally fine on its own forever. Um, we use, um, a couple of, well, we don't use, but the, the industry uses, um, manufactured wood products to, for making, um, replicating historic windows because it doesn't warp, um, and it's not supposed to rot, but it has a horrible chemical smell to it. Um, and it, it's not super time tested yet either. It doesn't rot as fast as new pine. So what I'm saying here is um, if it's been recommended to you that it could be fine, you can give it a go and just watch it. Um, I would also look into, I mean, depending on what you want it to look like, if you wanted to have a natural weathered look, um, there are different ways of finishing it that way, but also protecting it. Um, no one specific wood species is going to stay the same forever. So there's always going to be some maintenance consideration. Okay, the next one. How much should a museum budget for annual maintenance for a single bronze statue around 10 feet tall? Okay, so it depends on your location, really. Um, Ohio is fairly affordable and I'm kind of a small beans. Um, so I'd say conservatively per year, if it's a piece that could potentially be touched, if it's um, weathering, it's in the city, in the city pollution is a consideration, should be cleaned regularly. Um, I would say at minimum 5,000 a year. Um, you're looking at two grand for somebody to come out, 
who is a seasoned professional to look at the piece, gently wash it with the right um, products, and then do an overall waxing cold and hot, probably within the year one and the other. Um, and dealing with any patina issues that come up, that would be a minimum for 10 feet. So you don't have to get a lift and it's probably somebody local. So they don't have to travel um, or at least they don't have to travel to the extent, you know, um, if there are multiple pieces in the collection, um, there might be a consideration of cost um, or, you know, bulk kind of, um, but I'd say that's a place to start. Okay, this one's a little bit more specific. Uh, any thoughts on the proper coatings to be used outdoors or indoors that incorporate red colors that seem to be notoriously susceptible to UV deterioration? So there are a lot of products out there and I do not claim to know them all. Um, I know that there are brands that I trust for different things. Um, like Prosoco and um, Architectural Cathedral Stone, sorry, um, are two masonry cleaning and masonry restoration product companies that I, I trust. Um, I would say whatever product you're looking at, if, if you're looking for something that has the red tint, make sure it's a mineral tint. Um, look at the uh, the tint ratio in there, like the, the quality of paint that you get at the store is hundred percent based on what the fillers are versus the pigment. Um, so obviously when you're putting a tinted product on, you're going to want something that has a good mineral high concentration pigment in it. Um, if you're looking for something to protect a coating that had the red in it, um, I mean, first of all, make sure you have a good pigmented red coating, um, but then any, a UV product, um, you should look into them, make sure they have good reviews. Um, I just read specs a lot. I can't always recommend a specific product. Usually I'm working with a product that was already used and if it's failed, then I'll go and find a new product that is available locally and affordably in case anybody in the future um, if, or in case I'm not brought back the next year, something like that. Like, I don't want people trying to hunt down something. I explain specifically what we're looking for, um, how long it should last without maintenance or how often you should maintain it with said product um, and uh, making sure that it's accessible and it's not so new that it might be something that's discontinued the next year. Um, it's also kind of falling back on the, the historic preservation thing where um, the treatments are, they've been known for generations. The same products can be used everywhere. When a specific formula works, it'll be replicated. And you need to know more really what's in the product than the specific brands, um, which is, I don't, I don't commit these things to memory because they change every year and something just won't be available or it'll be out of the client's budget or something. And I, I need to know what the base thing is I'm looking for in that product and then find something that meets that requirement. So I'm sorry, I don't have a clear answer for that. Okay, we've uh, come We've come to the end of all of our questions that are currently in the box. So if anybody has any last minute questions, please put it in. You may see that Katie has posted that a recording of this presentation and a copy of the slides will be available on the Ohio Arts Council's webinars page early next week. So that's www.oac.ohio.gov forward slash webinars. And you can get, yeah. Uh, I don't know, Katie, if you also do on YouTube, but. Yeah, it'll be available on our YouTube channel as well. So um, the link on the webinars page will take you to the YouTube channel link. So you'll be able to find it both places. And it looks like if no other questions have rolled in, I think that does it for today's presentation. Um, thank you again, Joyce and Heritage Ohio for your partnership in presenting this webinar. Joyce, thanks so much for serving as our, our moderator. Uh, and Lindsay, thank you so much for sharing your you know, expansive 
knowledge with us, so many things to consider that that maybe folks hadn't thought about. So um, this was in incredibly valuable. So thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Have a run uh, wonderful rest of your week and uh, we'll see you next time. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>